a lot on Electric Ladies podcast about specific technologies and financial resources to address climate change and grow a clean green economy. There are also various ways to look at this challenge of addressing climate change, of needing to pivot an entire economy that's been fueled and managed based on certain foundational principles, not to mention certain fuels, right? That is to look at the forest instead of just the trees. A new perspective might help us communicate about the challenge and the opportunities better, more in, uh, in a way that engages more people in seeing the benefits for their own lives. So today we're going to talk to an innovative thinker who looks at issues through the lens of physics and explore new perspectives and new ways to communicate about climate change and the opportunities and solutions that it presents. So pull up a chair, put on your earbuds, and plan to think differently for the next 30 minutes or so. Welcome to Electric Ladies Podcast. We share stories, insights, tips, and advice from remarkably innovative women working on the front lines of corporate responsibility, energy, sustainability, climate, and ESG-related issues. I'm your host, Joan Michelson. We talk about innovation, leadership, technologies, and careers, always bringing a new perspective. Find us anywhere you like to listen to podcasts on our website, electricladiespodcast.com, and through my forums articles as well. And please pass it on to your friends. Leave us a five-star review if you're so inclined, because it helps other people find us. If you are at an inflection point yourself looking for support for either your ESG work or your career, please, please reach out to me in all the chaos swirling around us. There is a ton of opportunity and we don't want you to be flailing or miss out. So please reach out to me on Twitter. And yes, I will always call it Twitter at Joan Michelson and let me know no matter what industry you're in. This episode is brought to you by Competent Boards, a comprehensive training program for board members and aspiring board members. I'm doing the Sustainability and ESG Designation Certification Program, and it's truly a global, remarkable group that gives you the skills, strategic, strategic perspective, and confidence, importantly, needed for today's boardrooms, especially about the kinds of issues we talk about on Electric Ladies podcast. You can check it out at competentboards.com. Physics, 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 physics. Physics is in all the stuff we talk about on Electric Ladies podcast, energy storage, solar, wind, nuclear, energy efficiency, reducing carbon emissions this way or that way, recycling, eliminating plastic, our infrastructure, electric vehicles, etc. Physics is also at the heart of the way financial resources, believe it or not, are structured to fund these solutions like the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Investment Act, and the Chips and Science Act. But what if we used physics to look at the overall challenge of addressing climate change in a very different way, to identify different solutions, to hear different perspectives, to communicate about it differently? That's what my guest is going to help us do today. So let's learn something together. I'd like you to meet Jennifer Huff, the president of The Wide Awakening, a training program for high performers and creatives. That is an unbelievable oversimplification of what Jennifer does, but we'll hear more about that as we go. She's also the best-selling author. Uh, she's the author of five best-selling uh, authors books, boy, that's easy to say, including her newest book, Unstuck, about some of the subjects we'll talk about today. She's a trained economist, by the way, who also worked as an analyst at Procter & Gamble, became a business consultant, especially in human resources sales and holistic health, earned a nutrition degree and founded and ran the largest nutrition program in her native Canada. She's a founding member of the Evolutionary Business Council, one of those consultants that top coaches in the world to, turn to when they need a new way of thinking about things, the coach's coach, if you will. Jennifer earned degrees in economics, sociology, nutrition, holistic health, and of course, from with honors from the University of Waterloo and Edison Institute of Nutrition, and is in general, one of the smartest people I know. Full disclosure, Jennifer is also a good friend, so you will hear that in our repartee without a doubt. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming my friend, Jennifer Huff, to Electric Ladies Podcast. We finally did it, Jennifer. Thank we you. Thank you. finally did. And thanks for having me, Joan. I've been, you know, 
really at least a year have been excited to be here. So yay, yay this. Yay this, yay this. So well, as I said in the introduction, we need a new way to look at the climate challenge and the opportunities it presents. So lay the groundwork for us first, though. How do you think about where we are now? We can't we have to we can't look at it in a new way before we establish where we are now. So let's have some grounding in that. Uh, when you're looking at where we are and how we're looking at the climate challenge today, what do you see? When I'm looking at the climate challenge that we have today, what I see is that there there are certainly many reasons to be uh, reactive and concerned and very, let's say, dogmatic in our communication, whereby sometimes we might even polarize the situation. And it's justified. It's not like it's not justified to be communicating that way. There's so much going on uh, in every realm that, uh, that it's understandable. However, I also see that there's a huge opportunity because people who didn't understand how dire the situation was, those people are now having real world consequences to their homes, to their environments, to their ability to breathe, to how much water is on their streets, you know, whatever the case may be. There are real world, you can't deny it anymore. It's at your front door. And so there's an opportunity to have a conversation now that wasn't there before, unfortunately, because circumstances have gotten a little more intense. But, you know, necessity is the motherhood of the invention of good conversations. So there you go. Yeah, it's definitely um, opened the door to more people thinking about climate change than mm -hmm. maybe they wanted to, or at least feeling the effects of it. Um, and there's though There are still people who are intransigent about it. Um, so how do you think our perspective needs to change on this and why? Well, I think perspective change with respect to how we communicate about it. You know, Joan, I remember way back when I was, what is this, 10 years ago, I was walking with one of the founders of Earth Day. I was walking in the desert. There was a group of us. His name is Mark. He, I love this guy. And... Mark, I believe he used to work for Greenpeace as well. And I remember saying to him, sometimes, <laughs> I'm afraid to say this in front of you, Joan, um, but sometimes when I hear people that are vehement, and I, I perceive that he used to be one of those people that was pretty vehement, it almost repels me. And I know that it's not just me. You know, there's a, there's a, there's a sense that, it's too much and you're trying to scare me and it, it literally makes me not want to hear what you have to say. And we started having a really great conversation and decided to go for a walk in the desert from our friend Toddy's house in, uh, in some valley in, in Southern California. And we start walking and he had just finished saying, but Jennifer, there's so much like you have to, we're in huge danger, like resilience, humankind is in danger, the nature is in danger, you know, and, and we were having this really intense discussion. And I said, but the problem is that the more you speak to me that way, the more I lose hope and the less I want to listen. What's the point of listening to you if it's that bad? So then we go on this walk. And it's all, it's the group of us going on this walk. And he, then he says, and he's in flip-flops, okay? I'm in my hiking gear. He's in flip-flops because that's how he rolls. He's awesome. He just has such a direct relationship with nature. And he looks over and he goes, you see that tree right there? That tree, when the fires come, it basically only reseeds itself when fires come. So that's how that tree actually, you know, proliferates and then he goes you see that tree over there that tree when the fires happen the roots don't die but then it actually sprouts more trees than it had more of a tree than it had before because of a fire and i thought huh and i started to see this theme unfolding as he was speaking to me and i was getting inspired by the way that he was speaking to me because i didn't understand all this you know biology of the desert stuff and as he was speaking to me, I could feel like, oh, 
Oh, I see what's going on. And I pointed out to him. I actually pointed it out, Joan. I, I turned to him and I said, Mark, do you understand that what you're sharing with me right now draws me in? It makes me want to actually have a conversation with you about what I can do, what we can do. And the same thing happened recently with respect to um with respect to some of the things that are going on in the environment and what happened during COVID. Because we saw the entire city of Los Angeles clear up, you know, and the lakes start to have life in them where they did not. And pollution counts going down drastically. And I thought, wow, how resilient is this, this earth? It doesn't mean that we turned everything around. It doesn't, we're definitely on a very dire path. There is no question. However, isn't it interesting that that life saw fit to give us, albeit through a really challenging time and with so many deaths, so I'm not going to discount that, but at the same time, look at the light that also got shone on how resilient and how available uh, regeneration is. You know, yeah, and I think that also showed a lot of people that it is man made because if you took when you took man's activities off the streets, literally, I mean, Times Square empty, New York City empty was extraordinary um, as a native New York City girl myself. But uh, when people saw that, it's like you can't deny that this is caused by humans if cause and effect is in front of your nose. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And the the interesting thing is, I've had a couple of articles sent to me by one of Mark's friends, who happens to be one of my friends as well, who uh, founded, was the leader of Earth Day in Canada named Nigel. And he, he's been sending me articles lately that, that tout the really dire news. And again, when we're talking about physics, Joan, we're talking about, a, it, it almost has a repulsive, when you get overwhelmed, it almost has a repulsive effect. And it depends on who you're talking to. Because here's the thing, Nigel has looked at all these things, you know, ad nauseum <laughs> for years. And he also was just part of this incredible, like such a visionary a action that he took on the west coast of Canada with some friends of his, where they stopped an old growth forest from being mowed, mowed down by a logging company. And he did in the most extraordinary way. I mean, they were using helicopters, they were writing articles, it was flipping brilliant. So when I send when I communicate with him that way, he can hear it and he gets catalyzed to solutions. But when he sends me that stuff, I'm not used to finding, you know, all the billionaires all over the world to fund, you know, the helicopter thing and the, you know, these trees not being cut down. So the listening of the person that we're speaking to also matters, right? And so all of these things have to be considered when we're communicating to others we can't just blast our upset on people because either either the point of our communication is to be right and to be righteous and to show someone else how much we know or show someone else how much we know or how afraid they should be about what's coming or the point of the communication is to actually empower, inform, and give someone a direction. And so, if we're going to lead, then leadership requires the ability. I mean, I'm just thinking about some of the leaders that I'm coaching right now. We've just, I had this conversation just yesterday about this idea that if you're going to be a leader, the vision that you have has to become more important than your rightness about what's wrong, period, end of story. You have to be more clear on what it takes to get that vision accomplished than your ego being soothed by being affirmed by another. Right, and I would suggest just to 
go, I want to go back to something you said, but just to put yeah. a moment on that. And you have to be open to the way that that vision gets executed, though, too. You can have an idea of how it goes, but you have to be right. open to other people's input. If you're yeah. too much my way or the highway, then that's that's not going to work either. But, you know, just to play devil's advocate for a minute, the way yeah. that, that a lot of people talk about it and the fear stuff, like your friends have been sending you articles and and you know well that, that I see, it's also there are people who it inspires. I mean, there have been these unbelievable solutions of the, you know, on the 430 some odd episodes that I've had of these women who are incredible innovators who are saying, well, you know, I just couldn't stand that X was happening. And so I invented this wave technology or this recycling program or this, you know, solar uh, real estate investment trust initiative, whatever, right? They're, they're, they see a problem that needs to be solved and they solve it. So is that coming from fear? That seems to be me to be seeing something that's awful and needs to be fixed, but finding a solution to it and not just being overwhelmed by the fear. That's about cognitive dissonance. That's one piece of it. So, so when you can see something that doesn't seem right to you and somehow it strikes you as um, being integral to your uh, fulfilling experience in this world, like it, that, that particular issue, it strikes you personally. Sometimes... Well, in co let's go back a little bit. In cognitive dissonance, basically there's what is, and then there's what wish what you wish was. And you have two ways of resolving that dissonance. Either you change what is, i.e. some of these issues that people are seeing, and then they create a trust or they create all the things that you just mentioned. You go and hire the helicopters and you find the money, you know, all that. Or you actually get to peace with what is and if you cannot find peace with what is that dissonance often i'm not saying it always happens because if you can't find peace and you're not willing to take action what generally happens at least um when i look at my clientele is they get depressed because they feel they disempowered little, to do something right right, right. they get disempowered they to do something exactly disempowered to do anything they don't even know where to start or they can't find peace because it's not okay with them it's just not okay and so that in between state is where we feel that overwhelm we feel the upset and then of course we get paralyzed by by that overwhelm and then we do nothing and in the laws of physics when you're in that state that state of overwhelm and you're in that state of anxiety um what happens is you become more uh, vigilant for other things that might make you anxious because now your amygdala, the back part of your brain, is now looking for other things that you have to protect your, yourself from because you're already overwhelmed. And so this is probably the least functional place one, um, one wants to be when one wants to make a difference. Most of the people that you're in, well, every person that you're interviewing, I haven't watched all 430, but I've watched a good portion. <laughs> Most of your interviewees are people that felt the dissonance and then unstoppably figured out a way. Could have been hard, could have been difficult. They might have struggled. You know, they had to deal with governments, all the things, but th they have what I call a dream that's dreaming them. It's almost like the dissonance caused them to, unlike the person who's anxious, be vigilant only for things that are, you know, they resolve the problem and people and resources that resolve the problem. There's a part of our brain, I'm sure you know about this, Joan, there's a part of our brain Called the, called the reticular system and the reticular system basically uh operates from how you decide you want your life to go what you've decided is important so if you've decided that solutions are important your reticular system of your brain actually filters out everything else 
filters out anything that's irrelevant and has you only noticing that which would resolve what the problem is, if that's what you've decided is important. Just to give a really kind of inane example of that, it's like you decided you're going to get a, a pink punch buggy, you know, you're going to get a Volkswagen Beetle, right? Or a red one with black dots, like a, like a ladybug. And all of a sudden, in three days, you see three red Volkswagen Beetles with polka dots on them or eyelashes or whatever. And it's not, it's not, necessarily i mean we could talk about the laws of physics but even when we just talk about the way the brain is made you become vigilant you start noticing that which has become important to you and so just deciding when you have cognitive dissonance just deciding that you want to you want to be vigilant for solutions that you're available for them that you're willing to believe that it's possible and then being doggedly determined all of a sudden your brain only starts noticing those things. You know, it's so interesting. I was just going to, I was thinking about, we, we face an, a moment where we can either choose to be overwhelmed or we can choose to, to look for evidence of solutions and paths for resolution. Right. Yep. So instead of saying, I don't have any money or I don't to build this thing, it's, it becomes, um, where you put all your energy into where might I find the money? And that's always the difference between the, that, the people who make things happen versus the people who crawl under a rock. I mean, I have people who say to me all the time, well, you know, how, don't you need, you know, do you need asking me if I need guests and asking me if I need, um, you know, how could you possibly find all these women that are doing things? And I'm like, I don't need guests. Right. Pages of guests coming up. No, I don't. Thank you for sharing. You know, I don't understand how people can be looking for stories or be looking for guests or be looking for X because I see them everywhere. I mean, yeah. I have to choose That's it. ones, right? But how do you, one of the things that happens with people with climate change that is, is completely attitudinal is, well, I can't make a difference. Who am I? You know, my, yeah, and, and it goes to voting too, you know, which is an important thing. You know, sure, my vote sure. doesn't matter and I give them the math and hopefully that, you know, that helps. But but there are a lot of people who feel like, who am I to do that? Or my my effort's not going to make a difference or my, um, my vote's not going to make a difference. My action, my effort volunteering, you know, so yep. what, who cares? And I know you did this wonderful TED talk about the movement of one. So talk about how every little thing we do actually matters. And and to help people who, who might be in a in a mind loop of who cares, mom not making a difference, or I'm overwhelmed and there's too much to do, and I'm not going to invent the next great jet engine. Talk about how one person actually can make a difference on this, this in these issues. Well, that TED talk was pretty formative. I, that, like for me, it's all about the movement of one. And I don't just mean the movement of one person. I literally mean even the movement of the movement of us as one people. I don't mean that we have to agree with each other. We don't have to agree politically, financially, economically. I don't care. But the thing is that each of us has the capacity to, to make a difference in many small ways every day, many times. And so... And so, as a for instance, you know, in that particular TED Talk, I talked about this girl named Angel... And uh, at that point, I was a I was working at a big multinational, but on the weekends and in the evenings, I would go in on a van to work with street youth. And uh, I had met this uh, this girl who I was meant to walk to a, a mental hospital because she was suspected as having schizophrenic schizophrenia, which was pretty understandable given her upbringing. And she, I wasn't supposed to talk to her, but she just. <laughs> about anything you know i wasn't a i wasn't a youth worker i was an economist so i was just volunteering and she just dumped her whole life on me and i thought wow and in that moment i had one of those cognitive dissonance moments i i at that moment i was i was dissonant 
I was looking at this girl and I knew that there were hundreds of thousands of those kids in North America, probably millions maybe. And in all of the world, you know, tens of millions, I'm sure, in different countries. And I thought, how can anyone, like, I've been there. I understand that place. And I looked up in the sky, even though I wasn't, you know, I wouldn't say that I was agnostic, but, you know, I wasn't really sure my relationship to spirituality, but I looked up in the sky nonetheless, <laughs> and I said, you got to show me. You can't tell me a story like this that's like a living avatar for all the other stories of all the other kids in the world with so much pain and not give me an answer. And I knew I wasn't going to become, you know, I wasn't going to become mother Teresa. I wasn't going to go and that's not my thing. It's not my skill set. It's not my a thing. Right. And then I thought, well, I could take her home, but how does that solve the rest of this? And then all of a sudden it dropped in. This is the moment that changed my life, Joan. The moment that changed my life was that I looked up in the sky and I just thought to myself, well, the only way I can do that is to empower the people that can that are leaders that actually create the systems that have girls like this feel empowered and her brothers too, by the way, such that we bring up new kinds of generations of kids. I can't do that myself, but I can for sure teach the laws of physics and teach the leadership. So my, the direction of my entire life changed that day. Now that's a really big way. But and that little girl, that little 15-year-old named Angel, was a movement of one. She left her family to find a better life and had the courage to do that when they had threatened her with death. And I thought, if she can do that, then I sure as, you know what, can actually change the direction of my life and actually do something that, like, how can that happen on my watch? It can't happen on my watch. So, same, same, right? So, what do we do every day? So, then I, I didn't change from someone who empowered leaders. That, you know, I was 20-something years old. What did I know? I didn't know anything. I know nothing. And now I know I even know more and nothing just because with more experience comes more of the you don't know what you, you know, you know that you don't Ability. know. Right, right. Yeah. So, so, so now I, so what I did from that day forward is when I went into the grocery store, I developed a relationship with the woman working as the clerk because I was a clerk at once. I, I worked in a grocery store at one point. Um, I, when I would be in a cab, I would strike up a conversation. I would have the most extraordinary conversations with cab drivers. When I would go on a hike in the woods, I would pick up, I'd bring a garbage bag. I'd pick up all the garbage on the, on the hike. When I would go, um, on trip, and, and then I would bring people on leadership adventures all over the world. We went to Peru. We went and built um, a, a clinic for these mountain people that had no health care and people especially were dying at birth. And we, we helped to build a clinic. Two or three times we went back. And um, we went and worked with, you know, I could do endless things. Every project I did in a business right down to food banks every time I would do an event, we would get donations for the food banks. It didn't matter what I did. Everything had to be a net contribution to making the world a better place. And anyone can do that. Everyone can anyone do that. Can you, do could, you could have no money. You could have tons of money. You could be short, tall, black, white. It does not matter. You can do that. And the funny thing, Joan, this is the importance of this to me. This physicist, I mean, I said this in the TED Talk, but we're not in the TED Talk right now. A physicist said to me, Jennifer, if one molecule in the ocean moves, then all of the other molecules in the ocean have to move. Your one person doing one thing moves all of humanity. Because you don't know what happened to that per that clerk after you in a way you don't know what happened because someone saw you picking up the garbage on the on the trail you don't know you know you don't you really don't know i have a lady down the street that has the opposite political views that i do and i stop by her place and she's got major knee and back problems and i know so much about that because of my background in healthcare and working with doctors and getting her some leading edge help 
and we just have the best conversations. And she listens to me. So this goes back to effective communication and using the laws of physics. So here I am being a movement of one, right? I'm just, I, I decided to be a net contributor to the best of my ability every day with everyone I know. I don't care what her political beliefs are. It just doesn't matter. And in speaking with her, she became incredibly receptive to talking about some issues that if we had just started talking about them without that relatedness first, what would have happened would have been messy. But because we were related and because I'm just committed to not to be too crunchy granola or tree huggerish about it, but literally letting love win. Honestly, love for the planet, love for other human beings. I don't care how you language it. You can use other words. But letting love win. And all of a sudden, she's starting to understand my point of view. And all of a sudden, I started to understand hers too. And yeah, that's... It's, understand, it's understanding your audience. It's like yes. marketing 101. Absolutely. Yes. So it's a power I, place, right? You can move mountains from that place. Yeah, I love that. And it, it goes to how we um, reach people who how can I say this, who may, whose communities are in trouble, but who may not be adamantly against thinking about climate change or whatever. I mean, let, let's, for example, people in coal country, right? Yeah, they yeah. They want a job. They want right. a job. They right now believe in coal country and all of that because that's what their community is built on. Yeah. But what some people are doing, and I've interviewed some of them, yeah. is, is presenting another way for them to make a living to make their lives better. Yes. Rather than having it be dependent upon something that is giving them black lung disease and killing people when they go underground and, you know, aren't safe uh, besides and, the planet right, and stuff, right? Right. They're Trying to convince them that what they're up to is wrong. You're never going to have someone hear you from that point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And focus on the benefit to them of the solution that you're presenting rather than how their choice is wrong. So that, that it goes back to your point about, about hope. Um, what about trying to get people to, how can I say this? There are a lot of people who have an enormous amount of brain power, but who channel it in a direction that doesn't, that actually is kind of hurting them as well as the planet. And so, how do we how do we reach people so give that me they an see, give me an example of that so they uh, well frankly the people who did project 2025 you know the, okay. the trump agenda i mean these are incredibly smart people they're accomplished people they're obviously intelligent yeah. they've obviously studied the issues but they see you know if i'm looking out the window and i see sunshine they see darkness if i'm looking out the window and i see it's daylight they see it's nighttime if I mean, they're just, they're looking through a, so I it's guess it goes to, to, to agenda and bias coloring what you actually see. So how yeah. do we, but they're, but they're obviously smart people, right? So, and we know that, you know, they have their own self-interest, whatever, but how do we reach people who maybe are not as dug in as the Twaja 2025 people, but, but how do we reach people who, just don't see what's in it for them and you have to kind of take them there but you want you don't want to you don't want to make them wrong right well there is no point because the instant you make someone wrong you have separated and they will have zero interest in hearing what you have to say and so i go back to saint francis who said seek first to be to, to understand and then to be understood. So seek first to understand. Now this is this is some advanced stuff, uh, Joan, because we're not talking, I know your listenership is is comprised of a lot of leaders. So this is leadership level conversation because if you're going to lead, uh, the personal development work to transcend being triggered by someone else's self-righteousness is paramount. You 
you just if you want to get something done in this world that transcends what's already happening if you want to be a pioneer or a leader and make something new out of what has been be catalyzed by something you know that doesn't work then you have to be willing to listen to the people that are trying to hold dearly to how it has been and who are afraid of how it has been going away and one has to become a master bridge builder and in order to become a master bridge builder one has to be so committed to asking questions to drop into a place of understanding such that you understand where the commonality is and once you have that sense and this might take three five conversations it might take three to five months it might take three five years but the dogged determination i.e again that reticular activating device uh, just having you focused solely on solutions if the solutions aren't there you let it go until the next time it comes around but there has to be a commitment to never making the other wrong there's no point you instantly sabotage your own dream the dream that's dreaming you as soon as you make the other wrong so in order to build a bridge seek to understand first okay find the common points once you have the common points and you develop a relationship and then sometimes people hear this uh, people can hear this like isn't that manipulative no it's not man manipulative when you know that what you're doing is for the common good of the person in front of you too it's just uh relational and the the point of it is not to manipulate anyone to your point of view it's to expand both of your views if you keep the intent to expand both of your views if the intention is to expand both of your views then it isn't selfish anymore now we're making the world a better place where you can agree to disagree but there's a certain level of mutual honoring and mutual respect so the next step is you start to have you start to hedge into those conversations that might be a little bit difficult and you agree you make some agreements about how you're going to have that conversation and the agreements have to include that um, when you bump up against something hard you're going to redirect and go to something that's a little more fluid to talk about and you keep talking about the things that work until finally you have i mean this is really hard to give you an example of because some of these kinds of conversations take years right but eventually what happens is the openings on the hard part hard um topics start to happen and you know I don't know if you've ever heard that story about the um, negotiators. It, it was a couple. There's been a movie done about it. A couple that was negotiating. I think it was Israel and uh, the Israelis and Palestinians. And this is years ago. And it's when a huge, a huge agreement came to pass. And all they were doing is what I'm talking about right now. And it's my experience before I watched that movie, which affirmed everything that I had been thinking or had been experiencing with my clients it's uh it's it works it the next question is how do you the question of sustainability and in fact i wouldn't even stop at sustainability of those kinds of conversations not even about the environment of those kinds of conversations is is good but if we have a conversation about how do you make those conversations regenerative actually creative you know that you've reached the point of no return when you can have relationships with communities that maybe weren't your standard you know people that you hang out with when you can make it regenerative where when people are interested in picking up the phone and shooting the you know what with you and actually co-creating something that's when you know you've transcended the polarity and the divisiveness and you don't stop until you get there right right it's so interesting because there have been clients of mine who uh one i was helping them build relationships with companies that might um work with them and i've had I mean, I've set up amazing meetings with people. And I've had clients come to me and say, 
Well, I don't get it. All they wanted to do was talk about their kids. And I'm like, okay, that's kind of relationship building. And then, you know, you guide it to X and you got it to Y. And they looked at me like deer in the headlights. I mean, so so people actually don't know how to do this. I mean, you they and don't. I are natural conversationists, conversationalists, yes. right? So for people who are not natural at this as we are, so what are some questions that you use? I use tell me more um, and I've got my list, but what questions would you use that leaders who are creatives, uh, scientists, whatever, should ask both themselves and other people to help cre create those bridges? I would start with questions that you ask yourself before you even have the conversation and then go to those questions. The first question I would ask myself before I'm going into one of those conversations is, am I more interested in my vision or this dream coming to reality? Am I, am I connected to the vision that I have for what's possible for humanity? The second would be this. The second would be, I would ask myself, am I willing to transcend being triggered for the purposes of developing a connection? So that you can answer these questions for yourself before you go in. And the last is, am I willing to be curious about this rather than right? Like, can curious, curiosity and love lead the way, the love of the dream? So now when we get into the, once we've answered those questions, and if you, you know, if you get the buzzer on any of those answers, then you shouldn't go into the conversation. Don't even have the conversation and Kanoli, you can get into alignment. And don't lie to yourself about it either. No, I'm fine. I'm fine. I'm I'm not triggered. I'm good. Yeah, sure. So so we go into the conversation. Create a strategy, or create a strategy where you can get untriggered if you do. Well, you know, and we're talking about this, Joan, and let's get really real. You and I both know because we've done a you know, I I my whole world is about developing leaders, right? And that personal development takes some doing because and you have done tons of work on yourself as well and let's just let's not make it so trite that it just requires a strategy sometimes sometimes we have such deep triggers and fears that it's it's really hard to have those conversations without without being taken out oh, you know? it is it is but it does take self-awareness okay go ahead yeah it does so so the questions one would ask in order to um some of the conversational questions that would deepen that relationship i i like asking the question what's important to you like what are the most important things to you because then i know their deepest value and from there oh my gosh if you put all your conversation in terms of the things that are of most value to them and the funny thing is that's the place where you'll find that you have the most common ground with them because they'll say my family or my kids or you know my like my new grandbaby or they'll they'll talk about the things that really meant you know making sure one of my favorite ones that i've chatted about with my neighbor down the street is um is I really want to make sure in this case, because she's American, that America works, you know, that that it all works for everybody. And I said, you know what, I have the exact same value. I think the only difference is, is the how it's like, but, but we both have the same desire. So what's your what are your deepest values? All right? The next question the next question I often ask in these types of conversations is, um, somewhere in this conversation is, how can I support you in that? All of a sudden, they know that you are not there to be divisive. Another question I often use is, what do you appreciate about, about how X issue is working already like what what is working to you even if it's just one thing right um i'm always going in the direction of something that feels expansive something that feels like a yes something that feels like it it, it could move 
you know, it's a good starting point. It's, it's not a roadblock, right? I ask things like, how... Oh, this is a question I ask. I ask this of my clients. What's the most stressful period in your life? Like what what is the what is the most stressful aspect of your life so far in this life that you've lived? It informs me a lot about who they are and about why they get triggered. And I share mine too. I say the most stressful point in my life was mm -mm, you know I had kajillions of eye operations and I felt separate and alone and misunderstood and it was awful, you know? And so then they tell me something that was pretty formative for them and, you know, and all of a sudden we're sinking into the land of vulnerability. And when you start to know someone at that level, it's very hard to make them wrong. So, uh, so these are, these are some of the ways and that's how Mark and I, not that we didn't already love each other. I I loved him from the get go. He's an awesome guy, but I'm kind of that way, anyways. I I'm pretty I'm pretty curious about people. But you know, if but we had differences in what we were talking about, and the more we dropped in about who we were and why we were doing what we were doing, it just just this really lovey dovey, you know, wonderful feeling started to drop in. Yeah. So it's about finding the commonality in other ways it doesn't have to be on the topic that you're there oh please no showed up about yeah yeah in fact i would oh, advise it i would advise against that i would i would yeah, be purposely on something yeah else. on yeah. some other topic yeah well it's interesting because um there you know one of the things that i've said to people today is or in this moment in history that we're in is that the Inflation Reduction Act, the Infrastructure Bill, and the Chips and Science Act are helping everybody. Mm -hmm. And it's it's not a partisan, it's not only helping Democrats, it's not only yeah. helping people who believe in climate change, it's helping sure. people who want their roads and bridges rebuilt. It's yeah. helping people who want to have uh, jobs in, and want to know, distribute their country. goods and want to, exactly. yeah. Exactly. So I mean, it's things. helping yeah. people, yeah, it's helping everybody. So I want to ask you one other thing, and then I like to get some career advice for mid-career women in particular um, to close out. But yeah. before we do that, um, there are people who um, have resistance even so. So how do we, um, we're building this bridge, but some sometimes people are just, they're not willing to see it's kind of funny it's like sometimes if they you change the name of the person who pitched it they suddenly are supportive of it so how do we get past that how do we incentivize people to think differently how do we help people see the forest through the trees and see mm -hmm. other ways to solve challenges yeah well i, I th there's a couple of things uh, that come to mind recently and i wish i remembered the person that i'm quoting right now um but it was very recent and not someone who's in my normal sphere of people and uh it and i'm paraphrasing as well it goes something like this if you really want to change the world be someone who doesn't need to be recognized or acknowledged for being the one who did it or started it if you, can, yeah. if you can let go of your need. So in the scenario you talked about, Joan, sometimes even though you're the, you're the crazy expert on it, you're just the be all to the end all person. Acquiescing or, or sort of stepping back so that someone else can, so that someone else can step forward is the best thing you can do because that if you know someone has a problem with women or has a problem with i don't know whatever or here's here's someone of a certain ilk better than you then by all means if it's more about the vision than it is about the the you being the one then so that's one thing uh that comes to mind when you're when you're speaking about uh, getting it done with people who might be a little bit resistant. Uh, 
I've had, so right now I'm working with a, a medical doctor who's amazing. And she works with people from all over the world, different cultures. You know, it's it's quite the thing to bring different cultures together because there's so many triggers from so many different cultures that's, you know, acceptable in one, inspiring in another, and completely awful to a whole other culture, culture right? So she's learning lots. And one of the one of the things that I shared with her recently is when you have someone new in a really important meeting, ask them to meet before the meeting so you can get to know them first. Go, have, a, have a Zoom lunch. If they're around you, go out to lunch. If they're really important, fly there and go and have a lunch with them. Like it depends on how important they are. But I, I'm just going to say this, in a doggy dog world, especially in North America, every, well, especially in the United States, everything moves very fast. So sometimes, sometimes we forget about the importance of that relationship. Sometimes you having lunch with someone is the difference between getting that deal done and losing $5 million, you know? So remember that relationship connectedness comes first. It comes first. And so, um, especially when you've heard someone can be difficult or someone can be skeptical or cynical, it's it might take three lunches to get to know them well enough. If you make that the priority, that is going to mean the world to the results that you're seeking. The world. Huge. Massive. So, uh, last but not least... Uh, I am a really big fan of saying, let's put a pin in that or let's table that for now. Because sometimes what has to happen in the interest of a big vision, like, like everything in the land of ESG right now, right? Sometimes in the interest, you have to kind of like lose the battle so you can win the war, you know, just let just let it let it because you know how this happens this happens in the land of physics this is such a great thing to do it's in the land of physics when you get too myopic about getting something done what happens is it can put a lot of people off understanding this concept of spaciousness it's like letting an idea breathe and by letting an idea breathe i mean letting an idea actually roll around in someone else's consciousness and in the consciousness of life itself so that ideas you've just poked the bear you've just shaken the tree let all the nuts fall and let's see which tree grows you know you kind of gotta let it let it kind of breathe a little bit and what happens is people start coming to con conclusions that are either the same as your brilliant conclusion or they're coming to better ones because they have they know different resources and they know different people and they have different takes on it. And all of a sudden, by letting it breathe, you're actually and man, is that missing in the land of ESG because people can can get so attached instead of letting things have breath and you know. <laughs> You know this, Joan, one of my favorite sayings is doing nothing is doing something, you know? So in other words, letting things breathe is not doing nothing. It is doing something. It's allowing things to be formulated. And it is much more, I love uh, an article that you wrote recently about the feminine way, right? The, the way that women do things. And this is a very... I'm not saying a woman's way of doing things because it's more of the feminine and men have, th this is strategic. This is part of a strategy, right? So this is just a feminine tool to let things breathe. It's a feminine way. And I would say, actually, my husband's better at using this tool than I am even sometimes, depending on the subject. So like I said, it's not necessarily that women are better at it. Just know, though, that it is a key ingredient, knowing when to let something breathe. Well, thank you for that. And it's two things come up, many things come up for me, but two in particular, one is help them feel safe. So they come up, at, help them feel safe, number one, however long that takes. Yep. Help them feel 
come to it on their own so that it becomes their idea. Yeah. And don't assume a level of connection uh, on their behalf. I mean, I had a, a meeting, somebody approached me recently, just as comes, it's so stark, it's unbelievable. But somebody approached me recently um, to produce some things for me and, you know, liking our work or whatever. Yeah. And I had one meeting and then I had another meeting and the guy literally said to me, well, we like you, you like us, let's just do this. And I'm like, whoa. <laughs> like, whoa. And I never, I mean, why would I want to be bulldozed like that, right? It was like there was no letting it breathe. There was no getting to know each other. I mean, you don't you don't do a big deal. I mean, they were wanting to do like this whole multi-part yada yada. And I'm like, no, on a one hour Zoom call? No. Right. And I'm not going to be pushed. Yeah. And it's some of it's cultural. Some of it is, um, and I'm a New York City girl. I'm, you know, generally make. I was just going to say, what's up with that? A lot of other people, but you have to, <laughs> yeah, exactly. You have to, I mean, let the, the relationship has to evolve in the way that it could. There's, you're a hundred percent responsible for 50% of the relationship. And if the other 50% isn't there, you otherwise it's like your favorite thing talking about resistance. You're just hitting a, a tree. I mean, it's kind of a funny example, but it reminds me when I lived in Fargo and I couldn't cross, I couldn't get anywhere because the wind was pushing me back, right? Yeah. I mean, yeah. you're being pushed back. Yes. Um, so it's really, it's tuning in to other people. So it's a um, skill, dude. It is like, this is all part of leadership training and development. And in, in the land of passion isn't enough if you're going to get big things done in the world. Passion is a good start, but it is not enough. You have to do the personal development. You have to develop your communication skills. You have to do all the things, you know, that I, I love training in. I mean, this is key. And you have to understand the laws of physics when it comes to, especially when it comes to huge world changing ideas. I just got off a, a call, even though it's not in the, well, I suppose it is in the land of ESG actually, um, uh, it, that I shared with you, uh, with this woman who is doing this profound, she's a doctor that's doing profound work in the area of death and dying and having people have really mutually honoring deaths. I don't mean self-assisted -assist suicide. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about very honored journeys out of this world. And she is exquisitely, profoundly excellent at being neutral and at not letting her personal trigger, but it has taken years of work. She and I talk about it all the time. So we have to be doing that work concurrently to become an effective communicator. It isn't just about offering tools. It's about getting out of the way of our habitual ways of being, reacting, and thinking so that, and doing that by virtue of taking on that work, you're telling you're telling life, you're telling consciousness, and you're telling the dream that's dreaming you that the dream is more important than your personality, right? Just by doing the work. And the way, right. And the way that you envisioned the dream coming to fruition, the small business that you're looking to grow, whatever, it may not be that. I mean, PayPal is a great example, and I'm not a fan of Elon Musk and Peter Thiel, but Elon Musk started as just the payment operation for a whole nother company right. that yeah. we know nothing about anymore because it failed, but they pulled out payment. This was the one piece yeah. that now is like the part of the infrastructure of the economy. Right. Well, th then there's the whole conversation. Maybe we can have it another time, Joan, about precession. I think that would be a fabulous conversation within the land of ESG, actually. Um, yeah, because it's a big one. It's definitely it, it a big would, one. Yeah, it is a big one. Yeah, for sure. So well, before I let you get back to your life, you know, I could, you know, you and I could talk for 17 hours, but mm -hmm. um, I want to give career advice to mid career women. And, mm -hmm. and you're an interesting person to talk to about this. Okay. Um, I'm thinking of a woman who has, um, say, 15 years of experience. She has an education. She knows what she's good at. 
Um, but she's ambitious. She wants to make money and she wants to make a difference and does not want to feel that it has to be a trade-off. So what advice would you give to her? So I have three clients right now that fit that exactly. Exactly. And all three of them are women. So I'm looking at... So the first piece of advice that I would give is that in, in the spirit of the dream that's dreaming you, that you want, you know, I asked this question, Joan, you know it well. What's, I asked this question of my clients. What's the greatest thing that you can do with the skill sets you already have that lead, what, that might leave you feeling satisfied, fulfilled, and like you had a life of meaning and that you went to bed that night knowing that you did what you came to the planet for and you woke up in the morning excited about getting up, right? Answering that question sometimes takes six months, two weeks. It, it's not something that most people can answer right off the bat. They can answer it sometimes generally, but not specifically. So that would be number one. Get really clear about who you are and why you're here. That's why I did that TED Talk. It was a result. It was the answer to that question, right? The second thing is, In order for your glass ceilings to become your floors and for you to develop, and with these three women, it is so obvious, you have, one has to, everyone has to have someone that you're working with to be able to reposition, reperceive, and find the educational aspects that would have you develop the, both the personal skill set and the actual practical skill sets to make that ceiling a no-brainer, right? So you want to work with someone consistently that you love that's guiding you because doing it alone is for the birds. And I think most of us at this stage, I hope most of us know that finding someone to work with, man, that's so important. And the third thing I would say is, <laughs> well, this is what I had to do, transcend independence disease. Because as soon as it, what I love about you, Joan, is that you, you love getting help. You, you really do. You seek help. You, you are, yeah, you are, you, you got nothing to prove. Your vision, your mission is actually mostly on most subjects <laughs> bigger than <laughs> it's bigger than your personality. You're much more interested in making the difference. So independence disease is like you have somehow you have to you're proving something to some person from your past that you don't even know who they are and it has to be all about you. And there's a, there's a receptivity missing, especially for women. We have had to work in a man's world that can be extremely misogynistic and very unaware of its misogyny. And so what's happened is we're unaware of our own misogyny, how we are misogynizing ourselves. And uh, what happens is we stop having that soft receptivity that actually melts the room when we ask for help, not in a manipulative way, but in a way that actually brings everyone back to what's important. And that is the opposite of independence disease, right? So I really would stop trying to do it all yourself. Stop being a solo act. In in you know it might be well I'm asking for help I can I can hear this already I'm asking for help I have a I have a person that I'm talking to da 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 and but there's still this thing of they're only helping you so that you can do it yourself and so we're back to doing it yourself right instead of actually allowing yourself to be helped at a at an epic at a transcendent level a level that transcends the way that you're currently doing it so. Um, powerful yeah. it's powerful so, to do uh, i'm just going to add three things to that and they're mm -hmm. 
paraphrase maybe one is needing the you need outside input if you're trying it goes to kind of two of the things you said but in order yeah. to 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 rate we have your exactly. have, the, have your floor yeah. become have your ceiling become your floor yeah that you need outside input you're only seeing what you can see um, yeah that's why I wanted to to talk about the forest through the trees today but that also goes to um, what you're calling independence disease and and hold on another... hold on Joan Joan Joan, Joan I want I want to just say this as you're saying that last thing it's like and don't stop getting the help. How you'll know you've gotten the help you need is because it starts becoming easy. I want to make sure I offer that as long as it's hard and as long as you're having to push and as long as things aren't coming to you, you haven't gotten enough help yet. So I just want to put that in there because women are prone to like getting just enough help and then you just struggle again. Then you just push in the noodle again. So sorry for interrupting, but I just felt no, like that was fine. really important I, to say. No, that's good. And I think that also what happens is the obverse, which is when it gets hard, they say enough, you know, they put yeah. up, that's the resistance, right? Yep. But the other thing I would say, which kind of ties into that is when you talk about women in a man's world and how we've adopted some of those bad habits, it's like we, instead of, we're self-canceling, instead of saying, well, my way is X, um, let's, you know, what do you think of that? They feel like they have to go along with what other people are doing, group think, right? They have to go along yeah. with what other people are thinking yeah. and the way other people People are doing it just to be able to succeed. And in fact, it's the exact opposite. I mean, the the International Monetary Fund blamed the financial crisis on that exact habit, right? Yep. Um, and so... Oh, yes, totally, wasn't I it? Tell, I mean, it really yeah, was that, yeah. It was. I tell my clients that the minute you're thinking... Um, Oh no, nobody wants to hear that. That's exactly what they want to hear. And that's exactly what you have to say. So one of the things that happens with women, Joan, I know you've had this happen. I know it for a fact is that, and I've had it happen as well, is that we get told that we're too much, you know, you're just oh, too God. much. Yeah. You know, you're, the, you're a lot. And listen, I suspect that even if I was a guy, I'd probably be a lot. <laughs> <laughs> honestly i really do i don't think it's just about but that i'm a woman it just makes it that much more you know so um <laughs> it goes to the it's an expectation yeah but the other thing yes. i just want to get to that you talked about um uh getting new input to and being receptive is asking questions and and delegating i actually did an article on delegating um called why we don't delegate how and how to do it um but it's funny because obviously I ask a lot of questions and even in situations like events or whatever, not that I'm moderating, but even when I'm just in a Q&A, inevitably people come up to me or send me a note afterwards and say, I didn't know I wanted to know that until you asked it. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's and really but, interesting. Which speaks to the whole idea of you're not too much. It speaks to that your voice matters. If some you have some inclination, as you just indicated, you have some inclination that something needs to be added to the conversation. Oftentimes what I do to create an atmosphere of being able to be heard is I'll say, listen, you guys, I'm not sure if this has already been considered because oftentimes I do think that it's like, because I think it's so obvious to me that I think I'm asking a dumb question. So I'll even say that, not in a self-misogyny kind of way, in an authentic way. Listen, you guys, I don't know if this has been considered. Um, and it 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 feels to me like you guys might have considered it already, but what about X? And when you position it in a way that doesn't uh, presume uh, at the same time, it leaves an opening for people to catch up to what you're thinking without sounding arrogant. Um, again, we're back to it being well received and heard. So, yeah, I love that, Joe. I, I do that too. And I also say things like, you know, not to be a fly in the ointment, but, or, you know, let me play devil's advocate here or, um, I'm, I'm not afraid to ask what other people might consider or fear our quote, stupid questions. Cause there's yeah. no such thing. So, um, before I let you go, any final thoughts, any final thoughts, you know, 
we didn't talk a lot about physics, but we talked enough about it. And I think specifically with your audience, women in this realm, we don't have to carry the load of, of anything around what's happening with the environment and all the other stuff. However, if we show up inspired and we're really clear on why we're doing what we're doing, uh, we start to have our actions come from inspiration rather than the fear that we have about the world and motivation. And for a woman, because our thousand of thousands of years history is to take care of the house the kids the you know we're kind of general manager of the universe and now we're taking care you know it's easy to fall into taking care of the world and we can transcend that default way of being and let ourselves be dreamt by a dream and when we do that the carrying goes away and spaciousness and creativity all automatically show up and it takes some practice at first, but again, I go back to the personal development being so important because in order to get to where we need to go, um, all of us, men and women, need to transcend the triggers of our past and actually be in the realm of creativity so that we're building bridges forward. So, so is there hope in the from the point of view of the land of physics? From the point of view of land of physics, there are three things, Joan. One is that this is a fractal universe. In the land of mathematics, what that means is that everything is a pattern within a pattern of something else. Easily put, it's something like this. The We have DNA that spirals. And in that DNA is inside of a body that has uh that has a toroidal field running its energy and inside of that we have a spinning earth it spins and that earth is within a spinning galaxy you know the earth the earth moves around the sun at thousands of miles an hour it moves through the galaxy at 55,000 miles an hour and then it moves you know and then the whole galaxy is moving on top of that at at just untold miles an hour right and so everything is a pattern within a pattern within a pattern within a pattern that's what a fractal unit well, that's what it means to be a fractal pattern so any one change causes a change in all the other patterns if you change any pattern in the universe, it, it necessarily must change all the other ones. Then there's the physics approach, which is what my physics friend said. You just move one person, you move, move one molecule in the ocean, the entire molecule has to move around that molecule, right? And the last thing is at the basis of our existence, the basis of who we are, we are met, we are quantum particles we're 99.39% quantum particles. This three-dimensional reality is the result of those quantum particles uh, having intention come into 3D, and we get to experience ourselves, quantum particles actually, very small particles, but they've densified themselves into this three-dimensional reality and we get to play with three dimensions but we're actually mostly metaphysical particles so if we're mostly metaphysical particles and we understand how to flow with the smallest aspects of us and get out of the way of the three-dimensionality of ourselves then we can move matter that the metaphysical aspects of us, when we understand how to align with how nature actually works, how nature actually works. That's why I love speaking to you, because I'm actually talking how nature, talking about how nature works. When we can align with that, with those particles, what happens is we can then change anything. We have the capacity to change anything. So is there hope? Not only is there hope, but but if we're vigilant for it, 
we start to be vigilant for it, we can find transcendent ideas that cause this world to change much faster than we expect. It just takes enough of us to live that way. I love that. And we each have our role to play. So we're all pieces of the puzzle. system. Yeah. Yep. Thank well. you so much, Jennifer Huff, my sweet friend, <laughs> Jennifer Huff, for joining us on Electric Ladies podcast. And Jennifer Huff of the Wide Awakening. She's definitely been waking us all up for the last hour, re rearranging our brain cells. So what did you hear from Jennifer? How are you going to think differently now? What did Jennifer say that resonated with you? Post it to us on Twitter and threads at Joan Michelson. Send us any questions there as well for me or for Jennifer. Then you may win a 30-minute coaching session with me. Please subscribe to our mailing list to stay abreast of our amazing guests like Jennifer, our articles and career advice. And you can subscribe on our website, electricladiespodcast.com. I'm Joan Michelson. Thank you for joining us. See you next time.